Hello, everyone. My name is Sung Joon Moon. I'm a postdoc at McMaster. Um, and it's, it is my honor to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Wolfson. Uh, he had a long and illustrative <laughs> career at uh, Statistics Canada, uh, from which he retired as assistant chief statistician in analysis and development field, which included health statistics and the central R&D function. And he was awarded a Canada Research Chair in Population Health Modeling in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Ottawa from 2010 to 2017. Um, uh, while a senior public servant, he was also a founding fellow of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research Program in Population Health. And he's a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and an elected member of the International Statistical Institute. Please welcome Michael Wolfson. Thank you, Sungju, and thank you to the fields for inviting me here, and it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you. Um, I'm going to start sort of way over here with something that's very different from what we've been hearing about all day so far, which is infectious disease modeling, mainly using differential equations, but hopefully gradually I'll get over to uh, something that's uh, more familiar, and I have to acknowledge a number of colleagues, uh, starting with Sungju himself, and uh, folks at StatCan and various funding. So the plan is to start with an overview of socioeconomic and health policy oriented micro simulation modeling in Canada. So you heard uh, um, Neil Ferguson mentioned micro simulation first thing this morning and he said that was like 10%, 90% was uh, differential equation modeling. Well, I'm gonna spend 90% of the time here more or less talking about micro simulation and agent based modeling. Uh, then a bit about agent based modeling. And if you were here 15 minutes ago, you would have seen a little preview of a little video I want to show about uh, astronomy. And then finally conclude talking about a, an agent based model uh, that Sangju and Steve Gribble and I have been developing uh, for both flu and uh, uh, COVID and uh, make a point that evolution and stochasticity and actually ecosystems are everywhere and one of the advantages of agent based modeling one of the punchlines here is that it can incorporate those kinds of uh, key concepts so policy oriented micro simulation started uh, here in canada in the 1960s with the royal commission on taxation carter royal commission uh, a fellow named john bossons who was a professor of economics here at u of t was hired by the royal commission to help them figure out what would be the fiscal impact of changing, for example, the rate structure or the unit for filing, is it an individual or family? So that that um, analysis, uh, John basically got what was uh, formal, you know, Revenue Canada or whatever its name was back in the 60s to supply a computer tape with a whole pile of income tax returns. And the model just chunked through. This was, remember, the age of tapes and key punch cards. Uh, and recomputed taxes under a variety of uh, different scenarios. Uh, and this was straightforward accounting, what some people call a tax law model, and had no uh, behavioral response. By the way, I'm going to focus on Canada. The United States, uh, by the 60s, already had a number of micro simulation models, so it was a bit ahead of Canada. But Canada and the US by themselves are way, were way ahead and I think remain ahead of just every other country in the world. Uh, in terms of this kind of uh, modeling. Um, when I joined the government of Canada in 74, a hot topic was something called the Social Security Review. It was launched by a minister named Mark Lalonde, and it was about, can we have a guaranteed income in Canada? And uh, my first job when I joined the government and Treasury Board was to build a micro simulation model, or at least I asked my boss and he said, okay, if you wanna build one, go ahead. And it turned out the Department of Finance had their micro simulation model and Health and Welfare had their micro simulation model. So we had kind of an internal to the government of Canada a battle of the models. Something similar, I think, has been occurring on and off. It's not necessarily been a battle uh, among the different epidemiological or COVID modelers. But anyway, uh, it was very uh, useful and informative. It used a lot of data. Um, the re review itself failed, uh, FedProv relations kinds of things. But uh, it w provided the foundation for uh, the refundable child tax credit. Now, you pro guys probably are all too young to know about that in 1978, but we have a child benefit credit. And the whole idea of could the tax system deliver 
benefits, not just collect taxes, was a key question at the time. And these models played a critical role in being able not only to say, sure, it could, that's sort of an admin logistics kind of question, but here's what the fiscal impacts and distributional impacts would be. Uh, the federal government in the late 70s, early 80s, set up some super ministries, one for social development, one for economic development. Uh, I ended up at MSSD, the Ministry of State for Social Development, and the idea there was to do horizontal policy analysis, because since 78, we had the Department of Finance uh, holding the stick on creating uh, the pen on creating uh, refundable tax credits of various sorts. And then you had the Minister of Welfare saying, well, I want to do this kind of thing with family allowances. And the Minister of Employment saying, I want to do this with unemployment insurance. And you had this issue where different ministries were playing around in their siloed way, but they weren't doing integrated analysis. You know, so from the point of view of a family, you know, what would be the impacts of all of these different kinds of changes so the objective in MSSD was to uh, be able, among other things, was to do a horizontal analysis. I'm afraid the ministers of the day uh, really didn't like uh, the minister for MSSD dumping on their parade. So in the summer of 1984, the ministry was abolished. Um, and my career changed, so I went over to Statistics Canada. Fortunately, my boss at MSSD was kind enough to give me $100,000 at Stat Canada and say, continue building the model that you were building. Uh, it was a micro simulation model that could look at both tax provisions and spending programs. And that led to something called the social policy simulation database and model. Um, ever since then, I've never created an acronym without at least one vowel. Uh, this is a huge data muncher. It took, takes four different micro data sets, smushes them together, smush being a technical term for synthetic matching and stuff like that. Uh, we wanted it to be widely used, so we made sure that the data were non-confidential by design. And uh, it took a while for finance to come around. Uh, they were really ticked off at the fact that Statistics Canada had produced a model that broke their monopoly on being able to analyze tax policy changes with credibility. But they did come around in the model this year we are decades later is widely used by uh, provincial finance ministries, PBOs, the parliamentary budget office, uh, other groups. So the, you know, these, this is an example, I think, of one of the most successful uh, micro simulation models in Canada. Um, <clears throat> I had been involved in pension policy discussions uh, on and off during my career, uh, particularly in the early 80s, and I really missed the fact that we didn't have a dynamic model. The social policy model is cross-sectional. At any given year, you can say, what would be the impact of changing the tax rate or changing the level of the child uh, benefit? But it didn't do things over time. So the idea for pension policies, you really need to know what people's earnings histories were while they were of working age in order to understand what their pension benefit would be when they passed age 65 or the age uh, at which they became entitled to their benefit. Uh, this required all kinds of uh, data synthesis as we built the model, uh, because as we started, you know, I used to be responsible for this analytical studies branch and had a team of people inside there. I'm really, I was really spoiled. You know, I said, when colleagues asked me, why did you leave central agencies and go to this backwater called Statistics Canada? And my answer was, well, I'm inside the cookie jar. You know, I have unexpurgated access to all this wonderful uh, data. But anyways, so for example, from the Family History Survey, we could say, well, fertility looks like it actually depends on a whole bunch of things, not just the woman's age, which is typical of demographers who, uh, pardon my being a little impolite, but, you know, are hung up on these multi-state life tables, which don't allow much multivariateness. Uh, meanwhile, marital status itself, nuptiality was a function of a whole bunch of things. Education was a function of a whole bunch of things. So if we really wanted to model all these things, we needed to model them as co-evolving uh, characteristics of individuals in a population uh, where one thing depends on another uh, thing. Um, and so, um, and for policy purposes, it wasn't enough to think about some abstract theoretical steady state. We needed to embed it in real uh, calendar time. And this model was actually used uh, quite a bit in the pension policy debates of uh, about a decade ago, uh, Ontario was really keen on one of the options that uh, we had developed using the life paths model, but uh, they got overruled by some other provinces. <clears throat> uh, since I was involved in health quite a bit, I thought it would be really nice to move from uh, 
uh, social policy to health policy. So we started building something called the population health model. Uh, here the focus was on major chronic disease, cancer, heart disease, arthritis, uh, dementia. Uh, and this model has been used uh, not quite as heavily as some of the others by the public health agency, for example, and some academics. A more heavily used model is one uh, called Oncosim by the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. Um, and here the idea started with breast cancer, built a model of lung cancer, colorectal cancer, and of cervical cancer, was to uh, focus on screening. You know, let's model the way these chronic diseases start, how they evolve. And the good news about cancer compared to heart disease and other things is cancer epidemiologists have been highly skilled, mathematically inclined for decades. So we have a very good cancer registry in Canada, model development follows the data or necessarily has to build on the quality of the data. I'm afraid the heart and stroke people have not been nearly as effective in uh, getting uh, something analogous to the cancer registry. Anyway, uh, a big concern, uh, and the federal government put a pot of money, $250 million to start into creating CPAC, and one of its central objectives was being able to build these policy-oriented simulation models to say what would be the effects of different ways, more emphasis basically on screening in order to catch cancer earlier when it was more uh, treatable. So these models are able to produce projections of uh, screening volumes, costs, and cost effectiveness evaluation. So if it turns out that fecal alcohol blood colorectal cancer screening, you know, has a cost per quality, how many people have heard of a quality? Okay, quality adjusted life year, it's sort of the thing that you want to maximize uh, when you're doing cost effective now, effectiveness analysis and health policy. You know, if it's six bucks a quality sort of thing for colorectal cancer screening, that, that's pretty good. Um, uh, now, so far, all of the models I've mentioned are what we have called case-based. They simulate one individual at a time, or more accurately, one family or household or a case at a time from birth to death. Uh, and uh, but with cervical cancer, the screening question was related to uh, vaccination against the human papillomavirus. You cannot get cervical cancer unless you've been infected with HPV. But the only way you can really do a good job of understanding what's going on with vaccination and HPV is to model how especially young people are having sexual contacts with each other. And there we need an interacting agent-based model rather than, or micro-simulation model rather than a case-based model. So uh, we built uh, with the good graces of the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, something called the Human Papilloma Virus Micro-Simulation Model, HPVMM, uh, building on some uh, stuff, I'm forgetting the guy's name, the University of Montreal uh, had put together. Um, and then more recently, uh, I'm a co-investigator with uh, Jacques Simard and others uh, on a large Genome Canada grant where we're looking at the idea of what if we shifted breast cancer screening from being based primarily on age, when you turn 50, you start, you're offered screening every two years, to being based on your risk of breast cancer. And there is a good model, uh, I think it's the best in the world out of Cambridge, England, called Bodachia, that is able to estimate a woman's risk of incident breast cancer as a function of genetics, not only whether you have a BRCA1 or 2 gene, but also something called a polygenic risk score in your family history, as well as other non-genetic uh, risk factors. So in order to simulate that, we had to create a pre-model for the Oncosim breast cancer model that looked at how women evolved, how they interacted and inherited uh, the genes. Uh, we've simulated over two centuries so a large-scale interacting agent model in order to get a sense of the prevalence of BRCA1, BRCA2, the other major uh, mutations, and uh, this thing called a polygenic risk score. Um, and we're nearing the end of uh, the second five-year term of that uh, project, and that's been a lot of uh, uh, fun and important uh, kinds of stuff. And there's a ready audience for the model. There are people who are keenly interested in whether we can not only uh, save money, but more importantly, uh, target breast cancer screening uh, more, you know, for example, starting at age 40 and being annual, 
uh, for women who are at high risk and the same or less for women who are at low risk, maybe waiting till age uh, 60. Meanwhile, back at the ranch or over in much more in Europe than in North America, there, there's been a rise of uh, what folks there call agent-based modeling. And I have some colleagues who like to argue that agent-based modeling and microsimulation are different. I'm going to argue that they're uh, really different facets or different emphases on more or less the same thing. And there's major potential benefits if we can converge them. But for microsimulation, at least to start, the models I described have no agent interactions, whereas the agent-based models uh, that you see in a something called the Journal of Artificial Societies and Social Simulation, JAS is a good place to, to look at for these kinds of things. Uh, agent interactions are central. Uh, the microsimulation models, you know, we use millions of cases. Uh, this, the, a, these ABMs might have a few hundred or maybe a thousand uh, individuals. The microsimulation models, particularly ones I described, are hugely empirically grounded. That's why it's so important that they were developed, at least here in Canada, inside the cookie jar, inside Statistics Canada, where we had unexpurgated access to gobs of uh, data. Um, whereas, you know, some of these uh, artificial society models, you know, people make up concepts and pretend they can measure them. Uh, behavior response is a big issue. Economists are usually apoplectic about tax models or tax law models because they say you don't take account of the fact that when you change the tax law, people might work more or less or they might decide to get divorced so they can maximize their benefits. Um, whereas the agent-based models put more, have traditionally put more emphasis on, on behavior. And I think a crucial bit is that the microsimulation models, the reason they're mostly in government, in the United States, they're in big think tanks, but funded by government, is they cost a lot more. You can build an agent-based model in person weeks once you already have made the investment in learning how to write the software uh, in a particular modeling environment. But I think these two strands of development uh, ideally should merge. Uh, and there are software, uh, any logic is commercial software, OpenM++ is software that is being developed by Statistics Canada and is open source, they'll support both kinds of uh, models. So let me uh, turn now, I'm gonna, this is gonna be really fast, we'll, we'll see, uh, fly through two examples of models that are at the interface between agent-based and micro-simulation. They're bigger than the typical agent-based models you'll see in the academic literature, because they have taken person months uh, and indeed a couple person years to develop, uh, but they're not, you know, the multi-million dollar things that you see at Mathematica or Urban Institute in the States or the social policy model or CPAC's model, OncoSim. One is called Health Paths, still case-based, and the other is called, I used to call it TIM, Toy Inequality Model, but that sounded too self-deprecating, so it's now TIM, Theoretical Health Inequality Model. Um, so to start, you know, these models have both have a problematic, have an issue to which they're uh, uh, intended to uh, address. And in the case of uh, health paths, this is uh, uh, some data that Doug Manuel published you know, almost 20 years ago. On the left is life expectancy by different kinds of diseases. So IHD is ischemic heart disease at the top. And HALE at the right is health adjusted life expectancy. I'll explain what that is in a second. But the key thing is we have league tables uh, that say the most important diseases in Canada and most countries are heart disease and cancer. And that's based on life expectancy. Why? Because life expectancy is easy to calculate. We've had death certificates with cause of death in them for more than a century. You know, it's more challenging in uh, less developed countries, but even there with verbal autopsies and things. However, if we look at health adjusted life expectancy, especially for women, Osteoarthritis and mental orders, dementias of various sort, are the biggest health problems. So the way that Canada and other countries prioritize health issues, to my view, has been seriously distorted by the focus on life expectancy rather than on health-adjusted life expectancy. So what is that? So here we have a graph of a survival curve. And what I've done is show in various levels of gray shade Underneath the survival curve, I think I can actually, oh, um, you know, 
the idea is that if you're alive, you may not be in full health. You may be in somewhat yucky health. So let's suppose that we can assign a value between zero and one for how yucky you are in that particular person year of life. So the darker the color, the yucky you are. And there are, and this is what qualities are all about, quality adjusted life years. There are various generic measures of qualities. McMaster University is world famous for the McMaster Health Utility Index. Uh, George Torrance and David Feeney have been the principals behind that. Uh, I have a bunch of colleagues who have been keen on what they call disability-free life expectancy. That's the blue curve. But the trouble with it is it still dichotomizes health status, but instead of dichotomizing between alive and dead, it dichotomizes it between not disabled and disabled with some arbitrary cut point for what constitutes being disabled. But the, I actually did some courses in mathematics at this university ages ago, and I think the phrase I used to know was a riemann stilches integral. So basically, you take the integral under the survival curve weighted by the gray shade level, that's HALE, health adjusted life expectancy. It is the weighted area underneath uh, that curve. So HALE strikes me as the fundamental concept. I don't know if it's still the case, but until at least recently, one of the two key performance measures for the Public Health Agency of Canada, for the Government of Canada, was HALE for Canada. Uh, the folks there complained to me some time ago saying, we're not sure we can continue to have HALE as our key performance indicator because how do we make it move? My answer was, well, unemployment rate and inflation rates are key performance indicators for the Minister of Finance, and he or she has only limited control over those things. Doesn't mean that we're going to throw away the unemployment rate and the inflation rate as key measures of economic performance. Uh, so I don't know where that stands, haven't been in touch lately. So the focus of analysis here is HAIL based on functional health status. So you can see that one is full health, zero good or dead. In fact, McMaster found that there were people when they uh, administered the questionnaire that elicited the weights or the preference function over health states, uh, found that there were states worse than death. So if you're in excruciating pain, blind and deaf and immobile, uh, people did respond to the survey saying, well, I'd rather be dead. Um, and it's aggregated into a summary numerical index based on this weighting function that was elicited. And this is basically a quality. There are lots of different qualities in the literature, but to my mind, one of the crucial things we need as a society, societies, is a generic quality that will allow us to compare across diseases, not only disease specific qualities. Um, so Health Paths was created with the support of CFI some years ago and my colleague Jeff Rowe in order to estimate hail and to estimate sensitivity of hail to different factors. What is the causal story that underlies uh, health adjusted life expectancy in Canada? But hail, you know, it's a number, it's a scalar. So it could be a dependent variable in the regression, but my sense is that's really a stupid way uh, to proceed because really the better way to proceed is to say, hail is built up of all these constituent components. Let's model its components and then endogenously derive hail in the computer model. And we've already seen in the case of uh, life paths that uh, fertility affects uh, nuptiality, nuptiality affects fertility. These things co evolve. Well, same is true about diseases. So, uh, my colleague Jeff Rowe came up with some really nifty uh, statistical analysis, uh, which I won't get into. Uh, but simultaneously, this model has all of these state variables for each individual. So it's got the eight functional health variables plus income, leisure activity, blah, 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 uh, and uh, other things. Uh, and the way this was, uh, model was built was by saying, let's run some regressions. We use the National Population Health Survey. Uh, and because, you know, th there's a lot of people who like to model things in terms of Markov processes. And they look at first order Markov processes. They say, what's my state at time t plus one going to be not just unconditional on anything, but conditional where I was at t. But in any time I've looked and other people have looked, and you had longitudinal data that went back more than one period, higher order Markov processes were statistically significant. In this case, because of the jucking around with sample sizes and things like that, we used two period lags. And since the survey was every two years, we said, what's your health state at time t or the state of each of these variables? The previous wave 
and two waves back. So T minus two and T minus four. Lots of statistical analysis. Furthermore, the National Population Health Survey is a wonderful survey because in order to allow people to estimate variance in a uh, completely non-parametric way, there's a set of bootstrap weights there. So you can play around with saying, let me run the regression on one bootstrap weight, do out a sample prediction. Let me run it on another bootstrap weight, do out a sample prediction. So that's the kind of methodology. Uh, so you'll see that we have multiple instances of each regression. So the idea here in general, and this picture is in discrete time, but the model is actually in continuous time, is suppose we have uh, all of these variables, and those arrows are not all the possible arrows, but they show the pathways that have been estimated of effects from one variable to another. And uh, so if there's two periods of lag, you know, basically the rightmost uh, tilted rectangle is estimated as a fun or computed as a function of the previous two, then the next two, then the next two. So recursively until we fill out uh, the whole life path or health path of an individual, and we do that hundreds of thousands or millions of times, and that's how we uh, simulate a base case. And you've heard the term counterfactual, and that's what a lot of simulation is about, is what if we change something? So here what we're doing is saying, what if we knock out one of those pathways, think knockout genes, or alternatively, we knock two. So for example, what if we uh, say everybody's got uh, high income and they're well-educated instead of the actual distribution? Let's do the simulation and do it again and again and again. And so we can simulate a full counterfactual of what if there was uh, no SES impact on an individual's life path for a representative sample of individuals in the country. And the interesting thing, if we look here, I guess I can walk over, is these two panels are life expectancy, and these are health adjusted life expectancy. So in effect, this is an update and extension of the stuff that Doug Manuel did over almost 20 years ago. So if we look at cognition for men, in terms of life expectancy, maybe it's a fraction of a year, but in terms of health adjusted life expectancy, if you got rid of that, it would be four years, much, much bigger. So the most, and for women, um, uh, it, it's cognition and pain. Uh, pain. Pain doesn't show up at all in uh, life expectancy measures. One of the surprises from the National Population Health Survey when people started to look at it is we included pain not because we thought it was going to be important, but because it was one of the eight dimensions on the McMaster Health Utility Index. Well, it turns out it's the most prevalent problem uh, in terms of health status. You know, how much attention does it get in terms of health policy priorities? But anyway, so the, the multiple dots here represent 40 bootstrap replicates. So we estimated all of the regression equations 40 times, and then we ran the micro simulation model 40 times with each realization of one set of those regression parameters. So the dots give you some sense of the uncertainty. And this is uncertainty not only in terms of the uncertainty in the coefficient of the regression equation, not only uncertainty in terms of the specification, because we use the lasso type uh, estimation, but also the uncertainty for Monte Carlo variability. So it's three kinds of uncertainty that have all been convoluted together, as it were. So, and the most discrepant there are um, uh, pain for women and cognition for men. Um, we also played around with uh, creating more, uh, looking at the causal factors. And uh, so mental conditions, uh, uh, you know, are much more important from uh, the Hale point of view than life expectancy. Sensory function, which includes pain, again, big difference. Uh, body mass index, well, according to the National Population Health Survey, the bottom of the curve in terms of BMI versus health function is at 27. It's not in the 20 to 25 range that the WHA keeps talking about. And I saw an article in our local paper the other day that was claiming, <laughs> referring to a journal article that uh, uh, BMI is junk and should have been abandoned ages ago. But uh, just so you know, um, smoking status, well, it's important. Uh, so what have we got next? Socioeconomic status is important. It's as important as cancer. Uh, but 
the mental conditions and sensory functions uh, dominate. Um, let me turn now to the theoretical health inequality model. The problematic here is there's a continuing and unresolved debate in the social epi literature about whether or not higher income inequality leads to poor health. Um, and the literature I find really confusing because they make different, they, people don't carefully distinguish between my income versus your income. Those are individual level differences and income inequality, Gini coefficient or whatever you wanna talk about, because that's a characteristic of a population, not of an individual. And many individuals, you know, if you look at this literature, there's all these single equation models which have some measure of life, you know, like life expectancy is an independent variable. And they'll put a bunch of stuff on the right-hand side of the regression. Angus Deaton, a Nobel laureate, you know, was, uh, you know, among, you know, he's the guy who's been pop, become very popular for his uh, deaths of despair literature. But at the time uh, we were debating uh, 15 or 20 years ago, he said, all this junk about inequality is just that junk. It's really a black right uh, kind of thing in the United States. It's a racial thing. So we ended up actually uh, doing a multi-level analysis to show that he was wrong, um, but he got the Nobel Prize. Um, uh, but, you know, they, they, the literature is very confusing because some people are using counties as the unit of analysis, some are using cities, some are using countries, uh, some are using single year cross sections, others are using uh, multiple years, some with lags, some without. Uh, and uh, uh, the multi-level aspect was generally ignored. So I had the opportunity of working with George Kaplan and a bunch of other great folks uh, in an NIH funded uh, project that was uh, to look at the uh, relationship of, you know, trying to bring together complexity science with uh, social epidemiology and population health. Uh, and that's what was the genesis of this problematic, or one of them. I like this quote from Zimmerman, well, there's two quotes here. He, you know, he's basically saying a pox on the houses of everybody who's trying to do this analysis because um, it's going to be hung over by question marks. The literature has accordingly reached an empirical impasse, the cacophony that I just mentioned, because there's too many things going on. There's too many covariates or un unobserved confounders uh, in the literature that haven't been uh, properly assessed. So the, to rule out the possibility that income inequality truly does uh, affect population health, can't show it. Um, now here's the triggering uh, data for this particular model, which shows uh, the blue dots are US cities that uh, George Kaplan and company had put together. The horizontal axis is a, a very simple measure of income inequality. It's the proportion of income that's going to the bottom half of the population. Uh, and the vertical axis is the working age mortality rate. Uh, the red dots are Canada. I thought when we replicated the US analysis that we'd find there was a slope in Canada it just wouldn't be as steep. You know, like, you know, there's the old kinder and gentler. Well, Canada is kinder and gentler than the US, but there was no slope at all in Canada. Nancy Ross, now at Queens, but then uh, working at Statistics Canada, persuaded colleagues in Australia, Sweden, and England to replicate the analysis using their census data. And that's what the other colored dots are. So the UK and the US have a slope and the other three countries don't. So there's the empirical analysis that says, well, surprise, surprise, it's because the association is contingent, depends on which country you look at. That means if we wanna to try to understand what's going on here, we need a more sophisticated kind of analysis. And Zimmerman goes on to say, if we wanna get around the uh, empirical impasse, we need to articulate a sufficiently cogent and thorough theoretical uh, framework. And uh, so he says we've reached the conceptual impasse as well as a uh, th th uh, empirical imp uh, impasse. And here I'm being sufficiently immodest to say what I'm about to show you resolves both of those uh, impasses, or I submit it's a, a good effort to do it. So in order to respond to the conceptual impasse, let's create a theory that transcends the usual econometric aggregation blinders I'm not a fan of uh, neoclassical economics, even though I have a couple of degrees in economics. And we're, so we're going to use agent-based modeling. And as far as the empirical analysis, uh, we'll use whatever data we can. One of the things I did learn in economics is it's OK to use stylized facts. Uh, so you sort of wave your hand and smooth the numbers and say, well, here's roughly what the relationship is. Um, and if you don't have the data, let's make some assumptions. 
And but you do want to be at least Papirian or whatever in order to generate testable hypotheses. And in fact, um, Jim Dunn at McMaster has a grant from CIHR to go back and actually develop some of the key data Canada US on urban structure that I'll, you'll see in a minute, uh, so that we will 20 years later, 25 years later, be able to dig more deeply into all of this. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, simulation models in health science, you know, here I'm not talking about epidemiology or infectious disease epidemiology. My view is they're still underutilized. Uh, and here, uh, astronomy. So if we can flip to this, I'm an amateur astronomer, so I thought this was really a neat little uh, video. So, and you'll see in a second why I want to. This, I'm straining the technology here of presentation because we need to share two different screens. No, you're still in the slideshow there. You need yeah. to. Okay, so this is a computer simulation of interacting galaxies. So it's a kind of micro simulation model where each unit of observation is a star. And the beautiful thing about this particular video is the guys stop the simulation at various points, like about now, rotate it, and then superimpose an actual photograph from a telescope of that particular pair of interacting galaxies. Then they go back to the simulation, and there's a photograph, right? So this isn't proving the theory that underlies their simulation model of galaxy evolution, or the way interacting galaxy, galaxies look, but it is a plausible theory. You know, it isn't, you know, in the Popperian sense validated. It, you know, you can't say it's proven to be correct, but at least it's a candidate. Okay, so now we can flip back. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is for all the amateur astronomers or astronomy nuts in the room here. So, um, voila. So now I can click and say, uh, micro simulating people in societies is not rocket science or astrophysics. It's more difficult, right? Now, these guys may have used a supercomputer to make that video, but uh, the actual dynamics of each star was pretty straightforward. You know, there, there's certainly Newtonian gravity, there's relativistic Einstein stuff. It's a many body problem, so you can't solve it analytically, but you can't solve it on a supercomputer. So, uh, so meta comment about the theoretical health inequality. It's not the usual epidemiological approach. Yes, there are risk factors and causal relationships, but it's conceptualized first as a web of causality. And I hope as I go through the next couple of slides, what you have in the back or front of your mind is this is an example about the relationship between income inequality and life expectancy and health adjusted life expectancy. But why couldn't it also be an example of a model of infectious disease? So uh, we take a complex systems approach, in part because that was what the NIH funding was, and we have multiple, which means it's nonlinear. I, I saw one definition, what is complex uh, systems? It's the things that are nonlinear, but it's also multi-level. And there's coevolution of multiple state variables. And I found this a, a real challenge. I, I taught a couple of courses on this at the University of Ottawa, but the University of Ottawa, to my mind, failed miserably because I tried to make this a multidisciplinary course because it involved, you know, it involves aspects of all of those fields of study. But the university was unable uh, to allow me to list the course. I had to go through 20 committees, I was told, if I wanted it to be listed in all those different faculties. Uh, so I didn't bother. Oh, wrong way. 
Oh, I hit going back. Now I need to go forward. Uh, what do you think, this on view? <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, So the starting point in this little model is that there are observed differences in the distributions of cities by income inequality and mortality rates, and for simplicity I'll call them U cities and C cities, and the conjecture is there's something about the differences in urban structure and social forces in CNU, i.e. Canada and the US, uh, that is driving this uh, contingent correlation. Correlation in the US, yes. Correlation in Canada, no. And since most of the people in the group were American, funded by the NIH, they said, well, of course, it's neighborhood income segregation that's driving it, particularly uh, racial segregation. So we formated, formulated a potential explanation, built an agent-based computer model. We developed a bunch of stylized facts and uh, uh, established a reasonable set of parameters, and we ran the model. So the way to think about this is we had the two different kinds of cities uh, and the conjecture is that if we model cities where there's two main groups of parameters, was there high inequality or low inequality, and were the other factors, quote unquote, high or low, the contributing factors. And if we can generate a set of cities that reproduce a slope if, uh, in relation to inequality when the other stuff is high, but don't generate a slope when the other stuff is low, then we have done like the astronomers did, we've created an instance of an explanation of a theory uh, to do all this. Um, so, but there's an issue about, uh, you know, what's the minimum level of complexity that one needs in the model? So we uh, needed to consider the level of income inequality, neighborhood income segregation. Uh, we know that parents and neighborhoods do affect children's education and subsequently their incomes. Uh, we know that there are returns to education in terms of subsequent incomes, uh, and that income is a, a factor affecting your health and mortality. And we wanted to look at the levels and distributions of health, life expectancy, and hail. Um, so, you know, some stuff about models that you've probably all heard here, uh, but we needed to capture the main factors. Uh, we heard just before lunch uh, about heterogeneity so we absolutely need to if we're going to talk about inequality we have to talk about heterogeneity of individuals uh if we're going to talk about parental influences and things over the life course sort of you know in your 20s you worry about education and in your 30s 40s 50s you worry about what your income is we need to have trajectories it needs to be longitudinal and uh, because neighborhood factors are involved family factors are involved uh, the model needs to be multi-level so those are the minimum requirements for, uh, and certainly in my judgment, by the way, building models has got a lot of judgment calls in it. Those were the minimum factors and reasonable uh, researchers, analysts can differ on what those minimal factors are. There's an awful lot of art uh, to building models like this. Uh, and the model should be, uh, reflect the stylized facts. So there is the phrase uh, uh, ascribed to Einstein about keep it as simple as possible, but not too simple. And, uh, Hal Ashby in information theory talked about uh, requisite variety, uh, which and Stafford Beer also talked about that. And I would uh, I rephrase that to be requisite complexity. There's a minimum amount of complexity that you need to put in the model in order for it to have face validity with the people you want to talk to about the results. So the building blocks, you know, we have age, didn't bother with sex, uh, time, continuous health, D, Y, income. E, education, L, location. And we also wanted to have multiple levels of analysis, the individuals, their families, neighborhoods, and cities. So here's uh, some pictures. So at the first level, uh, E, your education affects your income, your income affects your location, L. Uh, your income also affects your health status and your chances of mortality, and your health status affects your chances of dying, D. So that's the starting point. But then we embed all these individuals in neighborhoods and we say, well, your parents' income affects your education. Your parents' income can also affect your income, not only through education, but through other means. And for the neighborhood, we can derive a measure of average income for the neighborhood. And the average neighborhood income affects your own education and your income, much more in the US than in Canada. 
If you live in a rich neighborhood, you're probably going to go to a good school. If you live in a poor neighborhood, uh, you know, I have one friend who said, you know, in this neighborhood, you know, it's all the teacher can do to take attendance. You know, the kids don't learn anything you know, because of a whole bunch of other factors. Uh, and we can also have overall average income and health, so things evolve through time. And then we have a bunch of neighborhoods that comprise a city. So that's basically the model in pictures. Here's the model in equations, and all of the equations fit on one page. Here it is. The tricky part is they're color coded so that the variables are at different levels. They're not all at one level. They're not all at the level of individuals. So the complexity comes in part from this uh, multi-levelness. <clears throat> so your neighborhood mobility is a function of your own income, your own neighborhood average income, and other neighborhoods average income. There's a famous model of racial segregation by Thomas Schelling, 1977, where even the epsilon level of preference to live in a neighborhood with the same color people as you, over time, as you iterate the model, leads to a fair degree of racial segregation. So the idea here is let's borrow from Schelling, build on that kind of idea. Um, so we're going to review the data, build on a bunch of stylized facts. Um, and I'm going to flip through these fairly quickly. Um, so we know from Miles Korak and others, you know, what he calls his Great Gatsby curve, that your chances of being high income in the United States, if your father was high income, is twice as high as in Canada. Um, urban governance, uh, well, let's, let's just go through this. So there's a steeper gradient of health status uh, in the United States with respect to income, although the data are not the greatest. Um, this is Minneapolis, St. Paul on the right, Toronto on the left. I'm un informed that Minneapolis, St. Paul has 200 elected councils of one sort or another, school boards, municipalities, things like that. Toronto, I don't know, dozen. Uh, between the different municipalities, so that there's been waves of municipal and school board amalgamation in Canada. There haven't been in the United States. Indeed, rich neighborhoods, as soon as they get big enough, opt out and create their own local government structure. Um, private school and median income, you know, look at all of the different school districts in California here. Uh, 38 school districts in Ontario, uh, and uh, what, 100 and some? Uh, across Canada, what was California? Uh, 772 school districts in California. Much more opportunity for local income levels to affect primary and secondary education in California than in Canada. Um, uh, parental influence on the, you know, these are the best data on student achievement re related to uh, parental socioeconomic status. Uh, so neighborhood influences. And here are the results. So the so the higher bars are uh, Canada, and so that's life expectancy and um, health adjusted life expectancy. It's sort of horizontal. And here are the U cities. You know, I'm not going into detail about the underlying results. And here I was, because we're in a computer simulation model, I don't have to restrict myself to the share of income going to the bottom half. That's the uh, middle bar uh, panel. So we can compute the Gini coefficient and something called polarization index. And in all three measures of inequality or polarization, we've more or less reproduced a horizontal line for Canada and a, a sloping line for, excuse me, for the sea cities in this theoretical model versus the U cities in this theoretical uh, model. So we have constructed uh, A, not necessarily the only possible theory to account for the observation. Uh, it's a testable theory with better data. Uh, the contingent correlations observed by Zimmerman uh, are represent an empirical impasse, but only when standard statistical econometric methods are used. And we've constructed a worked example to transcend all this. <clears throat> uh, it provides an acceptable theory. Two hypotheses have been examined, uh, and it turns out my American colleagues are wrong. It's not racial segregation that seems to be driving the Canada-US difference here. It's two other things. It's the intergenerational transmission 
of social advantage and disadvantage, which is twice as strong in the US as it is in Canada. Um, and it's uh, the, the income gradient, and it's the effect of um, uh, neighborhood or city structure, urban structure. So surprise, I don't know how many people would think of this, but my view is that a hidden gem of Canadian public health policy, in other words, it's not realized as such, has been municipal and school board amalgamation, which has resulted in a more equitable distribution of local public goods, particularly education. So now let me turn finally, uh, my time's uh, running out here, to uh, agent-based modeling and infectious disease. Uh, cold flu is a little model of uh, COVID and influenza interaction uh, that Sungju and I and Steve Gribble have been developing. And uh, Sungju's playing the lead here and being the guinea pig to learn how to write agent-based uh, models. So the uh, dominant method, which we've heard about until this part of today's uh, events has been differential equations, but the objective here is to say let's write down a standard style SIR differential equation model and let's create parallel implementations using agent based uh, modeling. Uh, we're using two of them, AnyLogic, which is Nate uh, Os Osgood's favorite stuff, it's a commercial model, and the other is something called OpenM++, which is been developed by Statistics Canada. It's open source. Uh, it builds on C++. You can think of it as a C++ precompiler or C++ bunch of libraries uh, with a lot of fancy syntax. Uh, so one objective is to you know show that we can do it, and then compare differential equation and agent-based modeling approaches, and then uh, continue on to explore extensions to differential equation modeling that are clearly realistic, but hard or even intractable uh, in DE modes. And then going on to compare the two different uh, software environments, for example, the learning curve, functionality, uh, and scaling. Uh, this is the model, and you can see that image out there on uh, Sungju's uh, poster. So we're building on a standard uh, SIR model concept. So for example, the SS means that you're susceptible for both the two diseases. IS means you're infected with one and susceptible still uh, to the other. We allow waning immunity and we allow transitions for one infection to be affected by whether or not uh, you're infected by the other virus. <clears throat> this is what the differential equations look like. I confess when I look at that, I say, oh my God, that's complicated, that's messy, that's not intuitive, uh, I'm not, whatever. But anyway, it can be solved uh, using MATLAB with something called Runcutta algorithm. Uh, this is a simple representation of what goes on in the agent-based model. So we basically have an agent, and the agent has two variables, a, a co-flu variable and a, a you know, flu variable, and you're either susceptible, infected, or recovered with each one. Uh, the wiggly lines say that Infection can affect the transitions the other way around. Um, and the dynamics don't have to be exponential decay. Uh, the only requirement is that you can write the code. So the algorithms for transitions and other things need to be computable or represented algorithmically, but that's the only constraint. So it's much more general uh, than DE frameworks. Um, so we're going to start with a large, you know, we're going to allow some large number, an arbitrary number of agents, uh, and they have the two state variables, so you're either susceptible, infected, or recovered. Start at time t0, and we're going to have um, a little n, which is the number of individuals who are seeding the start of the simulation uh, as being infected, um, and they evolve in continuous time. Uh, and uh, there can be heterogeneous uh, contact uh, rates and patterns, although for now they're just random. Um, the usual, which is the usual assumption, and we heard it relaxed in the previous talk, but we can easily, in an agent-based model, it's not hard to include uh, more realistic heterogeneous contact rates uh, varying not only by age, but by sex, by setting. You know, the, the, the question I asked uh, before uh, lunch there about uh, you know, essential workers. So here around Toronto and Peel County and in different lockdowns, one of the key issues was who are the workers that are still having to go to work, who can't work from home? And their infection rates were 
or higher. Um, uh, and you don't have to have a combinatoric explosion, as we saw before lunch, in the number of differential equations. You just add a subscript here for the agent. In terms of, or you add an L for location or an E for employment, uh, essential or not, uh, and carry on. You would need a higher dimensional matrix to say what is the rate at which it wanes or what is the probability of becoming infected. But that's just adding a dimension to a matrix or an array uh, for a parameter. And one of the things I learned sitting in math classes here at the university ages ago was it's a lot of fun and it's easy to add subscripts on the blackboard. And it's easy to add a subscript in a computer model like this and add a dimension to an array. Um, the usual assumptions are exponential uh, decay uh, for infectiousness, uh, for the duration of the infectious period, and for uh, return uh, for waning immunity. Um, and there are some other distributions that are tractable in DE formulators, but we can easily incorporate anything in an ABM. If this sounds like a sales pitch for ABM, it is, right? Um, so uh, we've generated the model with the same parameters for everything. So there's betas and gammas and all that stuff. Uh, we started by seeding uh, this model. We played around with different things, but say let's say let's suppose we start with three individuals who are infected with COVID and three individuals who are infected with uh, flu, and let's have various big ends, whether it's three thousand, ten thousand, fifty thousand. And if we start the ABMs with an exponential distribution for uh, the duration of infectiousness and for the duration of the immunity, uh, we can reproduce exactly the different, well, subject to a tiny bit of Monte Carlo variability. Um, but here's an interesting uh, simulation. This time, the um, uh, differential equation uh, is using the uh, exponential but we ran the agent-based model four times. The only difference was the starting random number seed. And one of the questions is, you know, when you have rare events, sometimes the, vir the epidemic will take off and sometimes it won't. If you have, you know, there are ways of putting the stochasticity at the front or before you start running the differential equation model, you wait to run the DE until you've got a large enough population. But here we don't need to do two different models, one for the initial stochastic uncertainty period. We just put it all in the same model. And interestingly, um, it's not easy to see, but um, two of the agent-based modeling runs, the infection uh, dies out, and two of them, it continues. Furthermore, instead of using exponential uh, decay for the waning immunity, we used um, a, you know arbitrary uniform distribution. And the idea, intuition, is that if you have a sufficient flow of people moving back from the R to the S, from the recovered to the susceptible, maybe you can get cycles. And it is the case, you know, as I've tried to, you know, I'm a real baby when it comes to this kind of literature, you know, to try and understand, you know, there, there are models that have, for example, a sinusoidal or cosine function forcing function in order to get seasonality into a flu model. We didn't bother with that. We just monkeyed around with the flow of susceptible or recovered back to susceptible, and it looks like we're getting some fluctuations here. And these fluctuations are not just stochastic, you know, Monte Carlo uh, variability. Um, so in this case, the vertical axis is cases per 100. Uh, DE has just one solution path; it has a non-zero equilibrium, but with only four replicates. And we, you know, typically when we're doing the cancer models, we'll have 16 or 32 replicates just to make sure we know what the variability is in our models, uh, we were able to generate two qualitatively hugely different uh, epidemic curves. And with the uniform rather than exponential distributions, uh, especially for waning immunity, we were able to get some cyclicality. So one of the things I'm curious about is how much cyclicality can we get into this model just by playing around with fairly uh, simple parameters. Um, possible extensions uh, to this model. Um, a key concern has been, you know, what is the effect on the healthcare system? You know, are we going to run out of beds? Are we going to run out of ICU capacity? So this model doesn't have it, but it's not too hard to add a, an H kind of state for whether or not you're hospitalized or an ICU state and have transitions into there. There's lots of models and which in turn have been based on different kinds of analysis of the evidence. 
um, uh, we can include, uh, you know, put something non-zero on the arrow from being infected with COVID over to your likelihood of getting infected with flu is COVID, for example, uh, protective. Uh, heterogeneous mixing, which we were hearing about before. Uh, you know, I, you know, back in the H1N1 days, I collaborated with uh, Babak Purbalal uh, in Vancouver and dumped out a whole bunch of uh, census data uh, in order to be able to differentiate. A, he wanted to build a network model for Canada, you know, to distinguish, for example, healthcare worker contacts from work contacts and school contacts. So, not hard to do in principle or conceptually, if you have a nice blackboard. Uh, what about the endogenous emergence of variants of concern? Well, we know those are conditional on the shape of the epidemic curve. Perhaps they're conditional not just on the maximum peak, but some sort of cumulative uh, volume of person days or person weeks of being infected. The more person weeks there are, the more chance there is for a VOC to uh, emerge. And certainly in the models we have for lung cancer, uh, cumulative pack years are you know, a key uh, independent variable for the incidence of lung cancer, and there's several functions of that uh, history of smoking. Um, and the degree of coordination, uh, suppose uh, you, know, you have a vaccination program for COVID and another vaccination for program for flu, how should or might those two things be coordinated? Um, biological realities, uh, evolution is everywhere. Stochasticity is everywhere. Uh, the One Health idea, ecosystems are everywhere. These strike, you know, in the spirit of the requisite complexity in modeling, you know, the, 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 there's always a challenge of your stopping rule. You can make a model too big, too complicated. So it depends on what question you're trying to answer. But these strike me as fundamental characteristics that uh, really should be uh, brought on board. And agent based modeling, micro simulation modeling are ways of doing that. Um, um, and agent-based models are, as I've already asserted, upward compatible. So anything you can do with a differential equation model, you can do with an agent-based model, but not the reverse. So summing up, evolution, stochasticity, ecosystems are everywhere. So in economics, I long since got tired of uh, differential equation models of economic growth and uh, equilibrium models. Uh, same is true here in infectious disease, in my view. Uh, they, so, but if, as soon as you abandon that, I'm afraid, you know, I, I invested a fair amount of time here, just up the street, uh, in learning how to solve differential equations. But that's useless human capital to me today. What's much more important is understanding how to build these models, how to work with the data, and produce useful uh, results. Um, Funding agencies, you know, let me close with one and a half points. It's a pain in the butt to try and get funding for this because building agent based models or micro simulation models has a higher minimum cost. It also requires a different orientation. You can't have, you know, post postdocs are wonderful, PhD students are wonderful, but they come and go. I was able to get this stuff done inside Statistics Canada because I had a permanent staff, I had a base of funding. And I'm afraid that CIHR uh, isn't able, doesn't have a window, uh, SHRC doesn't have a window for this kind of funding. Somehow NSERC manages to fund global climate modeling and astronomy and, pro and I don't know what CIHR does for protein folding, but it's not there for this kind of uh, modeling. And some other day I can talk to you about data needs, but not today. So thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Wolfson, for this interesting talk. I'm sorry, postdocs are coming and going. <laughs> um, I think we have time for.